I honestly wasn't expecting to make a video about the myth of Santa Claus and its reinforcement of Christian belief and capitalist ideology. Each according to his ability to each according to his means. That was until I stumbled upon Leland Nally's examination of thousands of letters to Santa written by children whose lives have been upended during the COVID pandemic. In these letters, we find an uncanny juxtaposition between unreflective childlike desire and a sobering concern for life and death. The incongruence only adds to the tragedy. Take this letter from seven-year-old Caleb. Dear Santa, can you pray for my Nana? She has Corona. I hope she will be better by Christmas. Can you bring her a warm blanket to make her feel better? I would like a Power Rangers Beast Morpher Beast X Morpher and a Power Rangers Beast Morphers Beast X King Mega Bone Nerf 12. Love, Caleb. I don't think I need to tell you there's a lot to unpack here, but let's try anyway. First is the odd idea that Santa is able to perfectly recreate something so overburdened with branded sheen as the Power Rangers Beast Morphers Beast X King Mega Bow Toy Nerf Dart Firing Action inspired TV series for boys 8 and up. A child's Christmas list is an invaluable window into what it looks like when a developing brain encounters commodity fetishism for the first time. The object of desire is so holy, so pristine, that its entire branded designation must be invoked, lest any half-aware adult mishear and purchase the wrong model. No, no, I want an official red under combination 200 my leg rifle! This has been the case at least since the invention of catalogs, but today it acquires its most abstract form. Take, for instance, this child's wish, a string of random letters and integers. Not just a product, but its specific hypertextual code. Here, one is no longer able to imagine Santa's elves painstakingly fashioning exact replicas of Legos or action figures. Rather, Santa is reduced to a glorified Amazon delivery drone. But alongside Caleb's materialistic needs is an immaterial plea, a prayer for his Nana. This was a theme oft repeated in 2020's Christmas letters. Children asked for presents just as often as they professed to forgo them, negotiating with Santa to secure relief for their families. They asked for school to start again, for their parents to find employment, for money to pay rent, and for a cure to COVID-19. They speak frankly about the deaths of loved ones and the despair they find themselves in. One girl, Bree, asked for dolls, clothes, perfume, and hand sanitizer. The more letters I read, the angrier I became, not only at our country's structural failings that pervade the children's narratives, but at the superstructural, mythical solution to those failings. I realized I wasn't reading Christmas lists. I was hearing prayers that would all go unanswered. I was seeing the form hope takes before it is stamped out. I was watching a people being abandoned by their god. And I, with the help of German sociologist Max Weber, had a few things to say about it. So this week, in the spirit of Christmas, Sea of Fog is proud to present the Weberian case for abolishing Santa. Santa Claus has long been an intriguing and polarizing figure within the broader religious practice of Christmas. This video won't be a history of the figure of Santa Claus, but suffice to say he is emblematic of the high degree of religious syncretism embedded in Western European Christianity. His benevolence towards children and trademark for gift-giving are derived from the real-life Saint Nicholas and also call back to the three wise men who visited Christ at his birth. But the association with winter and the ability to patrol the skies is all pagan. For this reason, as well as his focus on secular wealth and material goods, Santa has long been at odds with Protestant Christianity, despite his role in the religion's major holiday. When I was very young, the only kids I knew who didn't believe in Santa were those from extremely strict Christian families. For these devout practitioners, Santa was not merely a lie. He was a threat to the sovereignty of God. Why would a Christian who has found in Jesus Christ the greatest treasure in the world and who sees in the incarnation and life and death and resurrection and reign of Jesus, the most amazing story in the world, and who knows that in this real historical event, all the truth of myth and magic became reality. Why would such a Christian ever dream 
of replacing or obscuring or supplementing this coming true of every story worth telling with such a non-gospel, pathetic myth. It's a failure. It's a syncretistic compromise with culture. Santa is dangerous because of his profane materiality, both in his form and in what he delivers. His gifts are evident in the here and now, while God's promise of everlasting life couldn't seem further away to a six-year-old. Santa competes with God for the position of Heavenly Father, but his corporeality gives him an edge over God's withdrawn spirituality. And worst of all, Santa is magical, a cardinal sin in Protestantism. His pagan magic threatens the sanctity of Christ's miracles, and draws the hearts of children further away from God and into the world. Max Weber explored how the Protestant Reformation laid the ideological groundwork for capitalism in his seminal study, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. For Weber, a major upheaval of Protestantism was the rationalization of the world and the elimination of magic as a means to salvation, which he identified as persisting in Catholic rituals of atonement. The god of Calvinism demanded of his believers not single good works, but a life of good works combined into a unified system. For believers in the doctrine of predestination, magic and ritual had lost all their efficacy. If it was decided before your birth whether you'd receive salvation, all there was to do was work tirelessly for the glory of God, even if in the end you were damned all the same. Similarly, Puritans maintained a negative attitude to all the sensuous and emotional elements in culture and in religion because they are of no use toward salvation and promote sentimental illusions and idolatrous superstitions. So there we have it. Santa Claus is incompatible with Christianity because he represents everything that might distract a wandering soul away from the truth. But what if it were precisely the, the opposite? opposite? What if Christianity needs a figure like Santa that it can prop up and subsequently deny? a way to reintroduce magic back into the world before resting it away again? What if every time a child learns that Santa doesn't exist, it's a recapitulation of the whole Protestant Reformation, priming children for an even stronger belief in the god of Calvinism and capitalism? Let's back up to see what I mean by this. As I alluded to before, Santa is effectively the real god of capital, in that he disperses secular, material rewards for good works in the profane sphere. As with the Protestant rejection of Catholic purgatory in favor of solely heaven or hell, Santa only deals in naughty or nice, lavish gifts or lumps of coal. He offers the same promise that God does, redemption through a series of good works, only his can demonstrably fail to materialize. The Puritan's labor is lonely and anxious. He does not know his destiny even up to the minute of his own death. But the child knows his status on the naughty list at the close of every year. And this is where class antagonisms set up Santa to fail. The children who most require Santa's aid are precisely those to whom it will never be given. Kids with wealthy parents will be showered in gifts, while those who are poor will receive nothing. And because the receipt of gifts is tied to moral excellence, the lack of reward must be an indication of one of two things. Either the child is at fault, or Santa does not exist. In the former case, Santa's schema fits perfectly into capitalism's myth of meritocracy, that hard work and grit is all one needs to get ahead. Myths like this function only to legitimate class stratification and instill false consciousness in a repressed populace. A racing car set! Listen, you don't want that. Those are assembled in Taiwan by kids like you. These capitalist fat cats are inflating the profit margin and reducing your total number of toys. Hey, this guy's a carny! Hey, kid! But more perverse is what occurs when the child accepts that Santa is made up, which will happen eventually to every believer. Instead of setting the stage for further skepticism of religion, I contend that the knowledge of Santa's unreality actually cements the belief in a higher power. This is for the same reason that the Protestant Reformation yielded Christianity's most fervent disciples. The world is stripped of its last vestiges of magic, leaving only God above and a void below. The death of Santa Claus is the birth of Jesus Christ. When parents first introduce their children to Santa, 
they give God a human form, letting it take shape in a young imagination. And then, years later when the inconsistencies have become too much to bear, Santa is crucified on the cross of youth. The child emerges from this baptism of lies, steeled against any further intrusions of magic into this fallen world, having exchanged one father above for another. Slavoj Žižek contends that Santa Claus is a belief with no believers. That is, children cynically pretend to believe so that their parents aren't offended and the flow of presents remains steady. But reading Leoana tell Santa about the deaths in her family, or hearing about Preston's mom crying over the unborn child she cannot afford, I get the impression that Santa Claus is a real, if desperate, illusion for these children. Like an agnostic sailor uttering a last prayer in the midst of a tempest, perhaps it is COVID which has forced children to treat Santa as real. Already every winter our society goes out of its way to maintain this elaborate fiction, so why wouldn't they go along? We see this play out in bizarre Christmas media such as the song I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. From a psychoanalytic standpoint, it is easier for the child to believe their own mother is a harlot than to conflate their father with the big other, who is Father Christmas. Ideologies are made and unmade in both the telling and the dissolution of narrative. The fundamentalists were right. Santa is a dangerous story, but not in the way that they thought. So this holiday season, I'd like to suggest some healthier alternatives for your children. Why not tell them the story of brave Prometheus, who wrested fire from the heavens and was damned for it? Or regale them with the story of the serpent in the garden, the only one clever enough to steal God's omniscience for himself? Bird pecking at your liver? Forced to slither and creep upon the ground? Tell your kids not to worry. The price of defiance is always steep when one must challenge the gods themselves. Oh.